Hey guys, this is John. All right, today we are going to have a look at a famous endgame study. This was published in 1921 by Richard Reddy, the hypermodernist, grandmaster, sometimes problem composer. If you're a serious chess player, there's a very good chance you've seen this before, but it never hurts to brush up on important concepts. For those of you who are new to the game or just casual players, I definitely think this is worth your time to try to solve. It's a pretty enlightening exercise. So this is white to move, and white is trying to draw the game. Okay, so just have to try to draw as white. And white's pawn is advancing this way towards c8, two squares away from promotion, and black's pawn is advancing this way towards the camera. So if you'd like to pause your video and give this a go, feel free to do that now. I'm going to take a sip of tea, once again, just in case you guys haven't paused the video yet. Okay, once you start looking at this, it becomes... Well, maybe even before you started looking at this seriously, it, it's pretty apparent that white is struggling to draw here because even though their pawn is much closer to promotion, black's king is within the square and it can easily stop this pawn at any time. Uh, but white cannot say the same thing on the other wing. You know, white's king is hopelessly behind this pawn. If you were to play king h7 and try to chase it, this is just a losing battle. You can figure that out very quickly. Black promotes and wins the game. So, the only way to draw this position, as it turns out for white, is to try to combine operations on both the king side and the queen side. I'm trying to stop this pawn, even though I said that was a losing battle, but combining operations to stop this pawn, but also try to escort the c6 pawn. Okay, so the correct move for, for white to begin with here is king g7. And to understand why king g7 is necessary, let's think about the geometry of the board for a second. So let's just say this king is trying to get to the h2 square. All right, we just saw how the king pursuing the pawn down the h file is a losing battle. And if we count the moves to get to h2, I know this seems like an arbitrary square, but just go with me. Uh, that would take one, two, three, four, five, six moves. However, there's also a diagonal route that we can use via g7, f6, e5, f4, g3, and then into h2. And it turns out that also takes six moves. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it turns out, especially with a king, taking the diagonal route is often by far the best route because you can influence the maximum amount of territory on the board by doing so. So king g7, correct move here. And let's look at a couple continuations. Let's look at the most straightforward operation for black. So h4, trying to push the pawn. Now white continues king f6. Black may say, okay, h3, what do you got? And now we're not going to go towards the pawn via the g-file or anything like that. Uh, in fact, we're not even going to play this diagonal route anymore. We are going to switch and play towards the c6 pawn and try to help out the c pawn. So king e7. And if black plays h2, we can play c7. And now there may be mutual queening, but this is a draw. You can even see that white is promoting with check. And nothing has changed if black tries to play king b7 right at the last moment instead of queening, because white is playing king d7, and again, this pawn is going to promote with check. So by initially taking this diagonal route, you can see that white is threatening to help out the c-pawn. So after king f6 here, h3 is not going to cut it. What if black just plays king b6 here, though? Because we already established from the beginning that at any moment, black can slide their king over and basically just take care of this pawn. I mean, this now looks like white's in, in real tough shape because trying to go help the pawn, black will just pick it off and the h pawn is unstoppable. Uh, again, likewise, if we play king g5, the h pawn is unstoppable. Now, here's the most beautiful move in this entire study. So white to play can play king e5. Remember that diagonal route, king e5, centralizing the king with two ideas. So for one, we're still threatening to play king d6 and help out the c, the c pawn. So if h3, king d6, protect the pawn, h2, c7, black can promote first once again, but white promotes immediately after that, and there's no way that black is going to be able to skewer and win the white queen or otherwise do any damage here. This is a stone-cold draw. So king e5, we're threatening to go towards the pawn in this way, uh, and also... The other thing here, if black were to take on c6, which is really the only other move to examine, 
we are threatening to get in the square of the black pawn, a feat that previously seemed impossible. You know, from the beginning, it just looked like white was so far behind. But now after king f4, we can stop this pawn, king g3, and we even stopped it with a, a move to spare. So let's go back to the beginning. By choosing the diagonal route, white just barely draws the position, king g7 to start. And we looked at pushing the h-pawn, but if black starts with king b6, which is probably the only other logical move, it's going to be very similar, king f6. Note that black can pick off the pawn here, but we stop the pawn right away. And if black were to play h4, this is going to transpose again because of this beautiful king e5 centralization. So I wanted to share this important endgame study. Uh, try to choose the diagonal route for your king in a position. It may not strictly always be the best thing to do, but just being aware of that geometry can save you many half points in the game of chess. All right, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll be back again soon with another one. Bye, guys.